Thanks to the organizers for having me uh, come here. I was here about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, for the uh, collaboration that Dan mentioned, and uh, the first jamboree of uh, an oomycid pathogen, uh, the Phytophthora uh, soji and the Phytophthora morum projects, which were um, uh, funded and sequenced by, by the JGI uh, at the time, had tremendous impact on our community. So I'll, I'll tell you about these pathogens, but uh, first uh, I'll start with a general slide here. Um, uh, you've, you've seen these headlines. I mean, this is one of the great challenges of, of the century, and um, many reasons this has been described as the perfect storm, uh, the, 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 the food crisis. And, and one uh, striking, really, um, re reason and, and cause for this uh, food crisis is the population growth. So we expect in the next 30 years an extra 2 billion people on this planet. That's the equivalent of one China and one India. That's a lot of people to feed. Uh, and actually, these numbers were recently revised upwards uh, because um, population growth in Africa is not uh, stabilizing or is not, um, is not narrowing as, as we were expecting before. So it is, it is a big challenge for the, uh, for the century. And, and one of the um, issues we face is that there are many pathogens, many microbial pathogens, in particular eukaryotic pathogens, that have evolved to infect plants. And this here is a very simplified phylogeny of eukaryotes and show you all the different lineages of eukaryotic uh, microbes and, and others that have evolved to infect plants. And uh, what I, I'm highlighting here is the ones I will talk about today is the fungi and the oomycetes. So these um, are both microbial eukaryotes that share many features, but yet uh, are phylogenetically very different from each other, totally independent from each other. Uh, and, and the oomycetes here, the phytophthora and all that, are more closely related to brown algae diatoms, uh, very far away from the fungi. In fact, we are more closely related to fungi than fungi are to, to oomycetes. And these pathogens, these, uh, I refer to them as filamentous plant pathogens, cause a lot of losses in agriculture. And these are numbers taken from uh, an article published by Matt Fisher and his colleagues. Uh, and in the supplementary table one, they do uh, estimate uh, the losses caused by these various pathogens, like the rice blast, the potato blight, all these different filamentous pathogens. And here uh, I sum up these numbers, so it's, it's a lot of food being lost to these pathogens. Uh, and, and the sort of the most conservative estimate is about enough food to feed about half a billion people uh, are lost to, to these pathogens. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're looking at this and thinking, I don't really believe everything that gets published in Nature. You know, that journal, uh, you know, this, all these high profile retractions. I don't know if I should trust this journal. Well, guess what? The same thing has been published in Science. So. <laughs> So science went through the similar exercise and, and uh, identified the big seven, as they call it, the seven most important plant pathogens, uh, the ones that are having the most impact on the issue of food security, and five of the seven are filamentous plant pathogens. So you can recognize here the usual suspect, the rice blast, Magnapothe or uh, fungus, very destructive, potato blight, Phytophthora infestans, this is the one I study. So these are indeed very important plant pathogens. So I told you they're phylogenetically unrelated, but amazingly enough, these unrelated microbes share a lot of similarities in their lifestyle, in their habit, in their mechanism of infecting plants. And I'm summarizing here some of the key features. So many of these pathogens are very destructive indeed. You can see here this slide here, and, and you can see how the focus uh, of uh, the epidemic, which started here uh, with a few potato plants, rapidly spreads within a week uh, if if the farmer is not reacting and spraying chemicals in the right conditions, you could lose the entire crop within days. And, and indeed, these are very destructive pathogens. But the secret to their success is not their aggressivity and their ability to kill plants. More than anything, it is their adaptability. These are highly adaptable pathogens that have evolved mechanisms to rapidly generate and spawn new races that overcome resistance, overcome disease resistance in plants. And I will tell you later that plants are very effective of having a very effective immune system that can fight off, fend off these pathogens. So adaptability here is a very key feature of the successful pathogens that are a threat to our food. And the second point is the population sizes are just sometimes amazingly huge. You can see here a tractor plowing through a wheat field in Australia. You can see that cloud of rust spores, rust fungus spores, they're all orangey. You can see the, how many spores are really produced there. And so think for a moment about the genetic diversity in just that one particular field uh, of wheat infected with the rust fungus. 
Here's another example. This is uh, taken uh, closer to home in the UK. This, we just shook a leaf, infected the wheat leaf, a wheat blade infected with the rust fungus over the phone. And look at how many spores uh, fall off that just one single blade of leaf. So the population sizes are amazing. You can imagine the type of genetic diversity and the type of, um, essentially, type of variation that would be produced by just one, one infection. So uh, genomics has started, as I mentioned, about 10 years ago in this field. The first um, filamentous pathogen genome was sequenced about exactly 10 years ago. In fact, published in uh, 2005, the rice blast fungus. Uh, and this was followed by the project I was mentioning, the Phytophthora genomes, the first Phytophthora genomes just a year later. Uh, this was, again, thanks to the effort of the JGI. Uh, the, the pathogen we care about, Phytophthora infestans, uh, published a few years later. Uh, so this is truly an emerging field. We're just celebrating our 10-year anniversary here. And, and the field has, uh, is in a very exciting stage. And I'll try to illustrate that later in my talk, because we're moving from a very descriptive phase where we're really sequencing these genomes and describing them and noting how they're organized, their architecture, et cetera, the gene content. And now it's moving to a mechanistic phase of understanding mechanistically how these genomes evolve, and especially the link between genome architecture and, and evolution and adaptability of these pathogens. So that essentially would be the theme of my talk. And this is a, a cartoon taken from a, a review we published a few years ago. Silvara Ferrell and I went through the exercise of looking at about, about 30 genomes that were published at the time, 30 filamentous plant pathogen genomes. And we tried to sort of summarize the main features. We have the omycetes here, uh, the basidiomycet fungi, and the ascomycet fungi here, the three sort of major groups of filamentous plant pathogens. I don't expect you to read the whole thing, uh, obviously, but pay attention to this one column here. This is genome size. And the bigger the blue bubble, uh, the, larger, the larger the genome. And you can immediately see that in independent lineages, in totally unrelated lineages of these pathogens, in the omycetes, in the rust fungi, in the powdery mildew, we have this evolution towards very large genomes, large genomes that are bloated with repetitive DNA. So this is very surprising. This is not what we expect for parasites. This is not the textbook dogma that we all learned about. That parasites evolved to have reduced smaller, more compact genomes. Look at this, Phytophthora infestans, the genome size is 240 megabases. As a reference, the genome of Arabidopsis is about 150 megabases. So this microbe, this plant parasite, has a genome that's almost twice the size of the genome of the plant. And three quarters of that genome is repetitive. The rust fungi, um, about 100 megabases. In fact, the soybean rust, the Asian soybean rust, hasn't been sequenced because it's too big. It's estimated to be close to 300 megabases. And still half of that is repetitive DNA. Powdery mildew fungi, again, I know there's a new project. Uh, Mary Wildermuth is here, and this new project funded by JGI. Again, a very challenging uh, genome, uh, about 150 megabases. Two-thirds of that is repetitive. So this is unusual. This is big, rather surprising, right? In these unrelated lineages of these pathogens, there's this evolutionary trend towards having these big, bloated genomes. And this is in sharp contrast to many parasites and symbionts. And I just grabbed here some uh, headlines for various papers, just illustrating the fact that over and over again, the typical trend is towards more compact, more reduced genomes. I'll just pick one of these examples randomly. Uh, this is a soybean cyst nematode. When they sequenced the genome, the highlight was it's a more compact genome, a smaller genome than C. elegans. Okay? The spider mite also, 90 megabases. That's a very compact genome for an arthropod. So we have something unusual here. We have an evolutionary trend towards bigger, repeat bloated genomes. And why is that the case? And what are the evolutionary trade-offs that counterbalance the cost of having these genomes, not just the metabolic cost, but also the cost to the organism of having all these transposable elements, all these repeats, uh, basically messing around this genome? OK, so um, before I get to these questions, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the genome of Phytophthora infestans and, and introduce to you some concepts that are relevant, really, to the riddle, to the answer to the riddle. And, and what you have here is a potato field that was infected with the potato blight. <clears throat> and you can see here that this variety is doing very well. And the, this one here, these two here, are totally infected, destroyed by Phytophthora infestans, destroyed by the blight. And the thing to note here is that the difference between these varieties is a single gene. It's a single plant gene that's conferring immunity to the pathogen. And the challenge here is, as you can see, we can make 
potatoes that are resistant to the pathogen, to the blight. But the problem is the pathogen will evolve and will generate new races that will overcome that resistance. That's a true challenge here. It's not engineering resistance, not producing resistant potatoes. It's reducing uh, resistance that is durable and can fend off uh, new races of the pathogen, which we know evolve very rapidly. So I need to introduce the concept of effectors and effector biology, because this is very important for understanding how these pathogens evolve. And now we know that this is a general concept in plant pathology. Many pathogens, fungi or mice, bacteria, nematodes, even insects, we know now deliver effector proteins, often inside the plant cell. They have ways of delivering these effectors inside the plant cell. And these effectors uh, bind some targets, cause some perturbations in the plant, alter plant processes that ultimately are good for the microbe, right? And so any effector that will evolve to do something that is helping the fitness of the microbe will evolve as an effector, as a virulence factor. Now, the issue here is that some of these effectors, they can actually trip the wire and activate immunity. So the same effector that on one plant would be doing good things for the pathogen, if the spore of that pathogen lands on the wrong plant, on a plant that carries an immune receptor, then that effector becomes a liability for the pathogen and becomes now an activator of immunity and is actually now under selective pressure to evolve away from being recognized by the plant immune system. And this is because plants have intracellular receptors. These are homologues to the uh, node, uh, mammalian nodes, uh, node-like uh, receptors. And these immune receptors are extremely diverse in plants. Most plant genomes are full of them. And they can detect and co-evolve with these pathogen effectors. So all it takes is one immune receptor detecting one of these effectors for the effector to become a liability and activate immunity. And think about it this way, that cloud of spores I showed you earlier, and like many parasites, they have no control whatsoever on where they're going to land. So these pathogens are, have this gambling lifestyle. They produce this cloud of spores, they go up in the air, they can land anywhere, and they have to hope and pray that at least one of these spores would land on a, on a plant on the leaf that is susceptible and doesn't carry these immune receptors. And this is the challenge that these pathogens have. On one side, they're evolving to evolve new effectors that are better at perturbing the, the plant and suppressing defenses and improving the fitness of the pathogen, but at the same time, they have to deal with these plant immune systems. So, so they continuously under this, these effector genes are continuously under these opposite selective pressures, one push, pushing them away from the pathogen, from, sorry, from the plant, from the plant immune system, another force pushing them towards being uh, better effective. So that's a challenge. And so when we sequence these genomes, and uh, we discovered that 10 years ago at the Jamboree here in, uh, in, um, in Walnut Creek at JGI, and also we discovered it later in Phytophthora infestans, the big surprise was just the sheer number of these effectors. These genomes were full of these effectors. So this is, for example, Phytophthora infestans, this one class of effectors which we can easily identify because they have uh, signature motifs, over 500 genes. This other class, 200 genes, and maybe another 250 pseudogenes. So the genomes were littered with these effectors. And it got even more fun because the effectors were not randomly distributed across the genomes. They were occupying these expansions, these repeat-rich expansions. And this is an example here. So you can see there's good, good orthology, good collinearity between the different Phytophthora genomes here. Uh, and this is interrupted by expansions, repeat-rich expansions. You can see the black bars are the expansions. And if you look at this one effector family of which there are seven in this particular locus, the seven red arrows, all of these are in the repeat region, okay? So these genomes and all of the Phytophthora genomes, if you take this other one, Phytophthora soji, you'll find another locus somewhere else which has a similar expansion which would be unique to that species. So the genome is interrupted by these expansions, repeat expansions, repeat rich expansions, which have a few genes, but those genes are highly enriched in effectors and virulence factors. So that was the conclusion, really, from this genome architecture. And that was quite an amazing finding. We were very happy to find that in Phytophthora and Oomycetes. This is a way to visualize this. We did a lot of these plots. Some of you may have seen them, where we plot the intergenic distance, 5 prime and 3 prime. Most of the genes are within 1 half kb from each other. But we have genes basically in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the repeats. And, and these genes are um, far away from neighboring genes, flanked by repetitive elements. And if we plot the effectors, invariably they occupy these regions, these repeat-rich regions. Now, that was good. That was a nice finding. We we're very pleased with that. But then our colleagues working with fungi start also sequencing more genomes. And the crazy thing, really, was that the same architecture, the same genome architecture, start popping up in fungal plant pathogens. 
completely unrelated again, totally unrelated pathogens from the omycetes. This is Leptospheria maculans. This is work by Thierry Ruxel and colleagues in France. And they, they find the exact same architecture. The genome is interrupted by repeats, triggered by a retro element, and they have very few genes there, and the effectors are in the middle of these repeats. You don't see colors here because there's very few genes, but this particular one, for example, AVRLM1, is a single gene, a single effector gene, 250 kb of repeat. So that's quite remarkable that there is this sort of convergence towards a particular genome architecture in, uh, in these completely unrelated pathogens. So this is what I showed you. This is Phytophthora infestans. Uh, uh, this is the Leptosphere. Maculin should mention that in Leptosphere, the invasion by retroelement is fairly recent, and the retroelement is AT rich. And so you can see these isocore like, these drops in GC content, which correlate perfectly with the presence of the effectors. So whenever you have one of these expansions, this is where you find the effect. Turn out to be even more fun than that. If you look at other, other genomes more carefully, like the rice blast pathogen, Magnapothe oryzae, what you see in rice blast is the effectors are in also flanked by repetitive element, transposable elements, and these are occupying the subtelomeric regions of the genome, okay? And the effectors in different strains of the pathogen will pop up in different chromosomes, but always in the subtelomeric regions. All the fungi, um, such as Fusarium oxysporum, for instance, they pack their effectors in these accessory chromosomes, conditionally, cro uh, conditionally dispensable chromosomes, Extra chromosomes, which are very poor in genes, full of repeats, but also full of effectors. And it's been shown by Mata and Rep and others that if you move these chromosomes from one strain to another, you can confer new virulence properties. For instance, you can convert Fusarium verticilloides into tomato pathogen by moving one of these chromosomes and all its effector to that strain. So probably in this case, this particular architecture is facilitating horizontal transfer of these chromosomes that carry the effector gene. So we call this the two-speed genome. This is sort of our uh, sci SciCom, basically, uh, name for it, to communicate the concept more uh, readily. And the idea here is that we have compartments within these genomes that have a particular composition, basically an association between transposable elements, repeats, and the effector genes, and that this essentially improves the ability of this pathogen to evolve and adapt to resistant plants. And, and um, this concept, amazingly enough, is turning out in these very unrelated uh, genomes and has evolved over and over again in different filamentous plant pathogens. Okay, so how? How does the two-speed genome accelerate evolution and essentially improve adaptability and survivability of these uh, pathogens? If you asked me this question five years ago, six years ago, I would have focused on structural genome variations. Obviously, very obvious that these repetitive regions enable uh, more structural variation. You can have deletions at higher frequency. You can have an equal crossing over. Uh, there's all kind of stuff that will happen in these regions and will happen at higher frequency just because the nature of this region also would be less deleterious to the organism. However, it's turning out to be a lot more interesting. I mentioned the horizontal gene transfer. Mobile effectors have been now discovered in Magnapothe in the rice blast pathogen. In Japan, this pathogen is asexual. It's evolving just asexually for many, many thousands of years. And they find that the same effector gene with the exact same sequence will pop up in completely unrelated sublineages of the rice blast pathogens, but in different chromosomes. So now the model is that this asexual pathogen occasionally, just as fungi often do, there will be anastomosis, the, the, the hyphae will fuse, but then if you're next to a transposon, you're more likely to move horizontally from one genome to another and, and basically hitchhike with the transposon. Uh, uh, ripping is another one. If you don't know what ripping is, really look it up. Uh, there's a Wikipedia page about it. It's one of the most amazing things in ascomycid fungi. They evolved a way to fight off and basically kill transposon. And whenever there's a repetitive sequence, the second sequence is targeted by a particular um, machinery that essentially mutates it and kills it. Okay? And this is very easy to detect because the mutation bias is different from the normal uh, mutation bias. So it's easy to detect tripping. And now in Leptosphere maculans, for instance, the effectors that are close to transposons, they suffer from rip leakage because ripping occasionally would actually leak to the neighboring sequences. So if you're next to transposon, you're actually more likely to mutate. 
you will mutate at higher frequency than if you're located in other regions of the genome. And both in France and in Australia, virulent races of Leptospheria maculans that popped up in the field to evade resistant plants, both carried ripped versions of the effector gene. So that's amazing, isn't it? So if you're next to a transposon, you will mutate at higher frequencies. Epigenetics is another one where we and others are studying, and heterochromatin leakage is an obvious thing you could think about. If you're next to a transposable element, you're more likely to basically be adopted by the um, epigenetic regulatory machinery that is probably targeted also to keeping transposons and transposon loci in, in, in heterochromatin and inactive. So that can also leak, and we are also observing high frequency of gene silencing of genes that are present in the repeat region than the rest of the genome. So this is quite amazing, and, and this is also something that um, I think ties up very nicely with the debate that is going on now, which I think is a very superficial debate about junk DNA and what is junk, what is not junk, what is a functional sequence, et cetera. And this is actually a tweet from yesterday. You can see the date there. And it inspired me to put it here, because to me, the genome is a system. We can think about a functional sequence, like an independent sequence having a function, because it's a whole system here. Think about it this way. If you're next to a transposon, you will mutate at higher frequency. That's a system. You can't argue. Can you now have a discussion about whether that, that transposon is actually a functional sequence or not a functional sequence? And this is taken from Wikipedia. It's a fantastic way to describe genomes. It's a set of interacting or interdependent components forming an integrated whole. This is how we should think about genomes. We should move away from this concept of junk and not junk and functional sequence, et cetera. The genome is a system. And yes, there is some really cool stuff in Wikipedia, accurate stuff. <laughs> okay, so I think, um, all right, so this is really to explain the why. I mean, this is to, this, uh, I told you how, and, and I think now the field is moving to this mechanistic understanding of how the two-speed genome accelerate evolution, et cetera. The question of why is also a bit challenging, because yes, you can have these genomes that en enable more essentially more rapid evolution, but natural selection operate on the present, and evolutionary biologists have that conundrum. We cannot predict the future, so how would that work? And I think late selection is a concept that is a little bit ignored in population biology. There's a lot of focus on microevolution, not microevolution. And late selection, I think, is the way to explain how this genome will ultimately converge. Because the thing is, if you have a non-adaptable genome with these kind of systems, with plants that are continuously evolving immunity, you're not going to be able to jump from one population to another as frequently as if you have an adaptable genome, okay? And what I mean by jumping from one host to another, this can be from a resistant population to susceptible population. It could also be to a new host, which does happen in this pathogen at some frequency. So essentially, the issue here is survivability. What happens is, over time, the lineages that are less adaptable, they've been purged out they will not make it to the present time. They will not make it to the finish line, the evolutionary finish line, which is today, I guess. And, and they would be purged out. And so we end up with this conversions towards the magic formula, these genomes that have this particular architecture, which enables survivability over time. So that's basically the, uh, the concept. That's sort of the, the best way we can come up with this. And now, obviously, we have to do more modeling, et cetera, to try to explain whether the, what we observe matches this magic formula. So way to, to illustrate it is this example. I like this example. These guys, I don't know if you know them, but uh, these are two athletes from a um, picture taken from the London Olympics. Uh, Usain Bolt, the sprinter, and Mo Farah, the long distance runner or the marathon runner. And the funny thing here is if you are only interested in modeling and studying microevolution, sprints, short term evolution, over and over again, you come up with Usain Bolt as the winner. You would never predict that Mo Farah is the one who would finish the marathon. And that's really interesting, I think, in evolution is that genotypes that are in the shorter term less successful and able to compete with more successful genotypes perhaps are the ones that will actually be able to finish and survive and essentially av avoid extinction uh, and avoid being eliminated by natural selection over a long period. And so it's hard to imagine how Usain Bolt can actually finish a marathon with that particular genotype. Okay, so I think I have a few more minutes to uh, tell you about another story. One more minute, okay, all right, then I'll skip it. Okay, very quickly, so, um, <laughs> I, I, okay, I, I like talking, so, um, uh, all right, so, so I'll, I'll give you one slide, because I'll just give you the punchline, okay? So the story here is that this pathogen evolves also by host jump, and we've been going to its sister species that in, infect 
um, different botanical families, plants from different botanical families. So I skip all of this stuff. Uh, you can read about, there's links being tweeted. I'm actually live tweeting while I'm talking, so that's fun. The point here is that, is this, is that these two uh, orthologs effectors are both protease inhibitors, and they have evolved to specialize on the new host following the host jump. So this, this is the new, more recent uh, pathogen, more recent effector that infects this plant species called Mirabilis yalapa. It's not a potato, it's a completely different botanical family. And these two effectors, have shown very clear signature of adaptation and specialization. So this one can inhibit this protease, and the orthologue cannot in, can inhibit this other protease, and they don't cross in, inhibit their proteases as, as clearly. I never gave this talk in one minute, but I'll, I'll try here. So the key point here is this. In the evolution of these effectors, this protease inhibitor, there was this key mutation that occurred, and we did a lot of mutagenesis to basically pinpoint this one single amino acid mutation. It's a derived mutation, so it's a mutation that evolved recently following the host jump on a new host. And that particular mutation is a glutamine to arginine. That one single mutation is enough to explain how this pathogen effector has acquired a new activity to inhibit the new protease from the new host, okay? So that's interesting in itself. We have a new, uh, a new mutation that basically enables the effector to act on a new target in a new host from a different botanical family. The cool thing is this, the take home message is this. In acquiring that mutation, which basically broadened the adaptation, the ability of this effector to function on the new host, that mutation carries a trade off because having an arginine at that position has a cost because that particular mutant is enabled now to inhibit the ancestral protease from the potato pathogen, from the potato host, sorry. So arginine at that position clashes with the histidine and that steric clash basically prevents that effector from functioning on the ancestral uh, target. So the point here is this. The point is that as evolution, as natural selection drives these effectors to specialize, to adapt, they specialize. And by specializing, you have essentially the equivalent of antagonistic pleiotropy, where basically an effector that has adapted, specialized, is unable to function in the ancestral environment. And this is really challenging, and I want to finish with this. This is challenging because this is what we struggle with in, in plant pathology. These pathogens are driven by natural selection to be specialists, to be very powerful on their hosts, to outcompete other genotypes, but yet they have to survive over long evolutionary time. So that sort of balance between natural selection pushing you to specialize and also at the same time persisting over very long millions of years is, is the big challenge. It's a bit like these guys deciding to meet at an intermediate distance. They were actually talking about meeting at having a race and intermediate distance never happened. But one thing you can be sure of, they would not break any records because the specialist of the mid-distance would be the, basically much faster than either one of them. So again, the specialists, they should win the races all the time, but yet that's not necessarily what we see in, in the biota. Okay, so I'll finish there. There's a lot of people to, to thank. Sorry for being a little late. Uh, and, and many of these have moved on to other labs and I also have many colleagues to thank. So thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very thought-provoking uh, talk. Are there questions? I think we might have time for one. Stephen. So thinking about uh, what you said in, in Tonus's talk yesterday, do you think some of the reason these are in repetitive regions could be because uh, there's suppressed recombination and kind of co-adapted clusters of genes? I, th I mean, that's, that's definitely one, one possibility and, and one thing we cannot uh, ignore, obviously. But there's a lot more to that. That's, that's, I think that's a message here. And, and I think with only scratching the surface in terms of how, how do these regions uh, end up benefiting this pathogen. So there's much more than, than just recombination, suppressing a combination, et cetera. Any other questions? This one. One more. Last question. Sophia, and you want to comment on uh, how effectors could be used in plant breeding? Sure, yeah, I mean, effectors are now uh, widely used in plant breeding. In fact, I know even of work going on in industry that's not even published, et cetera, where companies now are employing effectors to basically as a screening tool. Because you can now, uh, in the past, the plant breeders use the pathogen to screen for resistant germplasm, but now you basically can go a step further and use the effector, uh, specifically individual proteins, to screen for resistance. And this. Obviously, that's a way also to integrate the genomic information and, and for, for example, focus on uh, 
what we and others refer to as the core effectors, so the subset of effectors that are more conserved than the ones that are uh, super polymorphic or show presence absence polymorphisms. Great, let's thank Sophie again.